Hello and welcome to the Global Wire Conversation. Today I'm speaking to Professor Anthony Packton. Professor Packton teaches at the University of California in Los Angeles. He's a historian and political scientist. His research has concentrated on the relationship between cultural, political and legal relationships between the peoples of Europe, its overseas settlements and those of the non-European world from the Atlantic to the Pacific. His main concern is in the political theory of empire, in how the West thought to explain to itself how and why it had come to dominate so much of the world, and in the present consequences of the erosion of that domination. He has written widely about cosmopolitanism, nationalism, internationalism, and about the history and the future of the European Union. He is the author of more than a dozen books, many of which have been translated into a number of European and Asian languages. His most recent publications include The Enlightenment and Why It Still Matters, the Burdens of Empire, Wars of the World, and a forthcoming new book on the history of the Enlightenment. He's also written for publications like The New Republic, The National Interest, and The New York Times. Professor Packton teaches classes in history of political thought from the 16th to the 19th century and the theory of international relations, as well as seminars on imperialism and nationalism, as well as the theory of racism and ethnicity since antiquity, giving us an historical look into the role of race relations throughout the course of history. As always, before we start our conversation, let me ask you to subscribe to our YouTube channel or to any platform on which you listen to your podcasts. Every subscription helps us to continue getting high quality guests like Professor Pacton. Okay, and this point is what I really think is outstanding about your work is because you're a historian and a political scientist. And I think what your work nicely shows is, on the one hand, the, the clarity of political science, but also the narration, if you will, of the historian. So there's always the historical background, which I think makes the reading very rewarding. One of your first books that I was kind of, that uh, for me was the entering into your work, was your uh, Worlds at War, which I think is, uh, it epitomizes very nicely exactly this kind of approach. So apart from the new uh, books you're working on and the articles, I think this is something I would warmly recommend to uh, to our viewers and listeners. If I'm not mistaken, you just recently submitted a manuscript for a new book. That is correct. Uh, yesterday, to be precise. Uh, final version, um, which is on the, uh, do you want me to say something about this? Yes, which is on the, uh, really the conception of a, of a unified Europe. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not a study of the idea of Europe, so much as the idea of the possibility that Europe might one day constitute uh, some kind of, and what kind is obviously the question, um, of unified political entity. And from 1815, which seems to me a crucial date, although I talk a bit about what goes before and the elements that feed into that, which of course is the uh, Congress of Vienna and the end of the Napoleonic Wars, uh, down till um, yesterday, which is when I submitted the book. So the last uh, comment was actually the last comment is a quotation from Emmanuel Macron, which I think was given in a speech about uh, two weeks ago. So that it's taken up to to the present, and uh, and it's fairly simply. I mean, it's chronological and it goes through, but it, it carries a, obviously can it has a theme uh, which runs through it, and a lot of that has to do with. Europe's um, engagement with the, with the non-European world, which of course has been, as you mentioned, the world's at war, has been part of my uh, research for the last uh, 30 odd years. Um, and, the, and the effect that being an, a series of imperial powers has had upon uh, the capacity for unification and integration. So of course, now I have to ask, is there already a tentative title for the new book? Oh yes, it's called The Pursuit of Europe, very simple, an intellectual history. 1815 to the present, that's the title of it, yes. So as you said, like you start in 1815, so kind of at one of the high points of the, of the Enlightenment, and uh, you wrestle with this question about the unification of Europe, as you say, not just from a theoretical, but very much also from a political viewpoint. But before we get into this, maybe we can talk a little bit about the Enlightenment itself, since it plays a very, a very prominent role in your story. Do you think it would be a fair characterization that the Enlightenment was not only a set of new ideas, but that it, it, it distinguished it from the previous times that it was dominated by, by Christianity and religious ideas, but that the Enlightenment created a new culture in its own right? Yes, I think that's probably right. I think it, um, it's, uh, one, it's, it's many, many things, but at one level, 
it was a series of, of conversations being conducted by uh, a group of intellectuals and uh, learned people, I mean, educated people who, of course, were by vast, vastly in the minority in, in the period we're talking about, across across continents, because it goes from, I've talked about largely in the context of Europe, it also reached into the Americas, into India, and so on and so forth. So, um, so there's that aspect of it. But it, it also, as people like Habermas have insisted, created this idea of a public space, and the public spaces was crucial to it, and it was crucial to the public space. So they, they created about it, and learned, I keep on insisting on this, a learned, polite, this is a word that comes up again and again, uh, series, a uh, cult cultural background, which is dependent upon conversation about interaction and so on. And this, in a sense, also established a set of rules and principles, which I think permeated, as it were, it's a sort of permeated downwards or at least outwards in the course of the following centuries. So I think it, it created a new culture in that respect. Though, of course, I would also want to insist, and this is also part of what I say in the book, that no new culture is entirely new. Obviously, cultures are evolutionary things. They're not coherent. They're not consistent. Uh, they uh, modify and change over time. They are modified and changed by those people who uh, inherit them. So that our culture today is not what we thought it was yesterday and so on. So, um, and it's very much dependent on what you, you call the, the preceding age, you know, the preceding age, which is sort of dominated more by Christianity. Um, and uh, it is an, an argument with and an engagement with those that age. So it's not simply a radical break with it. I mean, there are some who wish, would wish to argue that there was a complete and radical break. I don't believe in these radical breaks. I don't believe they've ever occurred. Um, and I don't, certainly don't believe that this was one of them. The Enlightenment had always been represented as it was represented by its critics in the early 19th century, particularly in Germany, as a moment of a sort of accommodation uh, with the past rather than a severe break with the past. But I think in its own right, and that is true to, to the extent that it was a dialogue with the past, that it was a continual uh, process of amelioration uh, with the past rather than an utter reject complete rejection of it. Do you think it would be a provocative statement to say that to some extent the Enlightenment was like a secularization of, of Christian values? No, I don't. I think I've, I've pressed that point on many occasions. So this is, in a way, one of the light motifs of the book, that what um, you could be said that a lot of the great thinkers of the Enlightenment were trying to do was to, as it were, strip Christianity of um, its Christianity, um, to take away the, the mythological, the Hebraic, the Judaic part of it. If you think of Christianity as a form of uh, what used to be called Hellenized Judaism. The, the, what, was, what they were trying to do to a great extent was to preserve that element of the Christian that was in the, Jude, the Hellenization, preserve the Hellenization and preserve that element of the Christianity that lay in the Hellenization, which contributed to this idea of a liberal uh, uh, secular society. So yes, the, sec the, the values are very much those of, um, of still remain the sort of core values of Christianity with the, with the, the, the dogma in the theological sense stripped out of it. Well, because this seems to be quite an important topic because this was also a, a, a key issue in the quarrel between Samuel Huntington and Francis Fukuyama, the matter can enlightenment values be universal Theoretically, yeah. or if they are, if they still, even though we we not, no longer recognize it, if they are so tightly connected to their 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 Christian roots, right, that any kind of claim to universal Enlightenment values could be tantamount to uh, to the claim of kind of a universal Christian religion, as you said, just without the Christian the, the Christian part, so to speak, and that this might be a reason. That, yeah, I would. My my view is that 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 this is a form of universalism that eventually gets anchored in um, something that has nothing to, the argument has nothing to do with Christianity. So you might say that the, 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 what we're looking at is a process of detachment from uh, the Christian past and, and the values of the, not the values, sorry, the, the, the dogmas of the Christian past while trying to preserve the values. And the values are not essentially all, all of them essentially those of Christianity. They are shared across a broad, they were shared across a broad cultural spectrum in the ancient world. 
and I think when we get into, particularly when we get into the uh, to the nineteenth century, and we get into, for instance, concepts of liberalism and utilitarianism, then the arguments underpinning those are not uh, essentially Christian ones. They are spent to be u- universal ones. And of course, the constant emphasis in the Enlightenment always was that whatever argument you have, it has to be an argument which is going to be acceptable to uh, you know peoples across the entire globe it can't be dependent on speci- it can't be dependent on any specific set of supposedly authoritative authoritative utterances whether they be divine ones or or political ones and so on and it cannot be dependent upon a particular set of cultural norms that are claimed to be superior to other cultural norms the argument of course against all of this universalism has always been that you know that the people making these claims are despite themselves in fact propagating a view which is limited in this way. But they themselves were not uh, attempting to do that. They weren't attempting to smuggle in Christianity by the back door, which is what the accusations have often been. Now, you know, you don't have a choice, it seems to me, in this respect, in that you have to be able, as um, I think Charles Taylor once said, you know, you have to be able to stand somewhere. You have you have no choice but to stand somewhere. And you have to be able to, to be a universalist you have to be able to say there is a set of universal values, and this is what they are. Okay. Um, now, and, and let, the only alternative to that is to be a complete relativist and say so there are no values at all. You know, I mean, your your view about how you should treat women is no better than mine. It just happens to be very different. Um, and that, of course, is simply to deny the existence that there, that there do exist any kind of uh, kind of universal values, which I don't accept. So. It's a it's 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 a conflict that at the end of the day there is no obvi- there is no obvious resolution to it. I mean, one of the key terms that that becomes popular with the Enlightenment is this idea of of progress and that the progress, because of the universalism of its ideas, should be accessible to anybody regardless. It's it's Kant's dictum of emancipation, and it's also the idea from from Kant, Hegel, other right that as as they say, history with a capital H, right? That that that, that the story of of humankind is a story of progress, is a story of development, and so to speak, different societies might be at different stops, but there is a clear drive towards an endpoint, and that endpoint then has been interpreted differently according to different ideologies. But to what extent do you think were individual figures and individual ideas important, or to what extent is that kind of the more Marxist argument that it was all the structure, right? That there was an, an economic structure, and and based on that structure, the Enlightenment did have to happen. But individuals, more or less, the ideas are the the überbau, the superstructure, as, as Marxists would call them. Or do you give a prominent role to the ideas? Well, I think that you know, I think it's a, it's a conversation again. It's an exchange between the two. I don't. And um, the, the 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 there is a uh, there is a reality out there. I mean, it's not that these are debates that go on in a vacuum, um, and or, or that they're simply carried out in you know, elegant salons in Paris, and they have no resonance outside outside the walls of those houses. Um, these are debates that are carried out by individuals who are engaging with the external world or aware of what's in many, many of them, of course, actually count as in many ways an exception, but most of them are actually directly involved in the business of the external world at some level. And um, so they're aware of a sort of Marxist superstructure and they're working within the terms of that. And that superstructure obviously affects how they uh, how they think and uh, fix the ideas that they produce. But I think there's a, there's a, there's a, a, an operation, a combination uh, operating between the two of them. I and mean, one of the examples is uh, the abolition of slavery, which has been taken on the one hand to be an extraordinary phenomenon brought about by, in fact, if you look at it, um, not so much by Enlightenment values as by by by, by Christian values. But the the, the, the precursor to the the, the the English emancipation movement um, was uh, during the years leading up to the French Revolution. And if you look at the writers in that period, and people like Condorcet and so on, you will see that there is a, a clear moral in, set of moral injunctions against us. There, and there are clear uh, rationalist arguments as well against treating people in this way. Rationalist arguments, which are entirely utilitarian arguments, which Jeremy Benson would entirely have approved of on the one hand. On the other hand, there's a Marxist argument that says one of the reasons why the slave trade was abolished is it ceased to be economically viable. Now, you know, I think there's the, I think neither of these two are absolutely um, to be ruled out. I think if it hadn't, if these messages hadn't fallen upon ears that were already being beginning to think that maybe there were other reasons for abolishing the slave trade, the slave trade would have been abolished when it was. 
It's not a, it's simply an action carried out by a small group of uh, you know, enlightened or Christian, in which, whichever way you look at it, Europeans, in order to bring about a better moral world. It was also one that was heavily influenced by uh, um, um, uh, uh, an economic, a set of, set of shifting economic circumstances. Had that having been said, if it hadn't been for the moral input, yes, it probably would have been abolished eventually, but not in the way it was, and perhaps 100 years later, as it was in the United States, for instance. So it, might be fair, not present. So, so, so it might be fair to say that there was a kind of dialectic of the enlightenment between yeah. ideas and, and, and the real world, as you say. I think, I think that's right. And I think, again, with this argument, look at Brazil and you look at uh, the United States, where these arguments, moral arguments, did not exist, or in the areas where slavery is practiced, they didn't exist. The uh, <clears throat> counter arguments in favor of slavery were very powerful. This thing took, uh, took another 60 years before, it was 60 years possibly before it happened. And, uh, and before there was any protest, it was over 100 years later. So, you know, there is a, there is a process of, of, of engagement, of dialectic, if you like, which then produced uh, these results. So I don't, I don't think, I don't see um, these theoretical ideas descending, as it were, from the clouds and, and, and manipulating um, what people, actors in the field. Uh, on the other hand, those actors in the field, whoever they may be, um, and particularly if they're political actors, are by no means, uh, you know, or can afford to be um, indifferent to, to the ideas that surround them. It, it, shape, it shapes their, their intellectual worlds. They operate on the basis of that. There is, you touched on this now a little bit, if, if you don't mind me going a little bit deeper into this, about kind of how, how enlightenment values, how these new ideas um, permeated societies. I was always asking myself, if we compare Europe and the United States, it sometimes seems to me that in the case of the United States, the enlightenment ideas, if we look at the Declaration of Independence, if we look at the, uh, at the US Constitution, were, mm -hmm. were more bottom up. Whereas in, in Europe, a lot of it seemed to come top down, right? Joseph II, Frederick the Great, in the sense of, of the, the, the enlightened despotism, where, where it was rulers who tried to impose certain values in and, and I would say in many cases, very well intended on the yeah. population, whereas in the US, it seemed to be the other way around, where, where, it, was, where it was a bottom-up movement. Well, you know, the US is, it comes into existence as a result of a, a revolution of a sort. Um, a lot of, uh, so that you're talking about, again, how, how, how within what context, political and social context, can these perceptions, these ideals operate. Now, if you look at the case of Russia, or you look at the case of Spain, or you look at the case of Germany, of Prussia, um, these are all states which are already autocratic states. You know, the, the, only, the only way you can bring about a complete change of this is by revolution, which of course is what takes place in France. So you have a, a, a revolution in France that produces us in which these ideas of the Enlightenment or Roughly speaking, um, and there's this old view of the Enlightenment, you know, set the torch to fly, flame, and so on. But these are ideas which then produce the revolution. They produce a very different sort of revolution in the United States. And you could say that in both cases, what you have is you have a, a, a top down attempt at change um, in Europe, which in the case of, say, one of the states is always left out of this, but it's very interesting, is actually the Bourbon uh, Duchy of, of, of Tuscany, which had a very enlightened constitution um, and was really working very much, very close with a certain group of, you know, figures less well known perhaps because they're Italian, but, but um, on, on, about the uh, on, on certain kinds of enlightenment values that were then instituted into this constitution. But you're still talking about an autocratic state that's run by a king, or rather by, in this case, a duke, who then goes on to be king of Spain, of course, afterwards. So you have, and the Spanish one, the Spanish constitution is very much the same, the Portuguese is the same. These are, as you say, these are forms of enlightened despotism as one way uh, of operating it. You could look upon the United States as a form of enlightened despotism being operated not by uh, the, the the monarchies, because the monarchies were disposed of, but 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 by the um, by the aristocracy. So you have a, a bourgeois aristocracy. It's true, but if you look at the the founding fathers, they're all English uh, gentlemen of one sort or another, and what they're instituting is very much a moderate form of Enlightenment constitution, and it is very much being imposed upon. Uh, the people from below. Um, but of course, there's a completely different po political order, completely different legal structure, which makes it much easier to operate in that way than it would be uh, would be in Europe. The only way to operate in Europe was as, you know, when Didor writes, 
uh, to help Catherine to the great or attempts to help Catherine, or, or, or Voltaire goes to help Frederick. You know, these ideas is that you can only operate through the existing structures of power. You, you, one thing the Enlightenment is not, certainly in, in the period anyway before, if you, that's how you interpret it, of course, but before the 17th, is essentially revolutionary. Don't be believe any of these great figures that you're going to bring about the kind of changes you want through revolution. You're going to bring it back through amelioration, and that is going to be brought about by persuading those already in power that they have to institute constitutions of, uh, of one sort or another. Yeah. New the, constitutions about change. The, the reason I was asking, I'd be curious to hear your opinion, is that at least in self-perception, sometimes reality differs significantly from self-perception, but it sometimes seems to me that in the United States, there is this perception that, that, that liberty and, and freedom is something that is a right to be protected by the government. Whereas in Europe, at least in continental Europe, I think Great Britain is, is a somewhat of a different story, but in continental Europe, there's, and I think this came a little bit out also during the, the, the global pandemic now, the idea that, well, freedom and liberty is good, but ultimately it's something that is granted by the government. And, and I was always wondering, is this something kind of a, a, a leftover also from the Enlightenment times where, yes, more liberty was granted to the people, but it came through Frederick the Great or Catherine the Great, whereas in the United States, there was at least in, 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 the, in, the, in the founding myth, this idea that it was the people who took back liberty and instituted a state whose main purpose is to protect the state so that, that there is at least theoretically, much more of distrust towards the state and government in the United States than there, than there is in Europe. And that this might be at least, I'm simplifying here, but this, that this might be a little bit of a leftover in the way the Enlightenment unfolded in continental Europe and it, how it unfolded in the United States. Well, it's an interesting idea, but I, I, I think that um, one ought to be rather more skeptical perhaps about what it means in the United States. I mean, the thing is also, of course, there's the major question of France where, where the, the changes were not brought about by uh, the monarchs at all. And in fact, they were you know, not only resisted by the monarchs, but after the collapse, you know, after 1815, the monarchs tried to put, turn the clock back unsuccessfully as it turned out, but then you've got, you know, you've got the second fall of the Second Republic, you've got Napoleon the Third. There's this constant sort of attempt to kind of get back to, and if you look at the, even if you look at the structure of the, of, of the present uh, uh, French um, state, you have this monarchical uh, president, very similar to what you have in the United States. In fact, there's a sort of similarity between, strong similarity between the two. But if you look at, in fact, what the United States has, it's a kind of, uh, you know, a, a mixed constitution along the Roman model, or as, you know, critics have said many times before, along the, the type set up and after this glorious, so-called glorious revolution of 1688, you have a constitutional monarch who happens to be someone who's now elected rather than chosen by, by blood lineage, but otherwise is effectively a constitutional monarch. And then you have the two houses the represent and so on. So I think, but also I think there's a there's a great deal about about the United States. There's a, in, in terms of it, you're quite right about its emergence during the current pandemic, the, the hostility to any kind of government restrictions and so on. I think there's there is um, a, a this idea of liberty that emerges out of the revolution and remains very strong. How much it's part of how much it isn't something that was actually very much modified and changed over the course of the 19th century. And what it actually means in American terms is, is, uh, is, is very much open to question. I, I mean, it's an intriguing suggestion of yours and I shall give it more thought, but I'm not, I, I wonder whether um, the, the language of liberty, it, it, enshrined in the constitution has been battered into people's heads mostly during the, during the war the, the the civil war of course and afterwards um has come to mean something very different in the united states it's come to mean essentially freedom from 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 it's it's, it's almost an an, an, an anti-constitutional view of life it's a way that says there are no citizens there are just individuals and uh, and yes, we'll we'll obey the laws if they happen to suit us, but if not, not. And a lot of the people who have been protesting recently and you know refusing to wear masks and so on, so on, and of course they they also exist across Europe as well, and they're using the same sort of language. I mean, I'm, I'm talking to you from France, and you know there are people having parties down the road in Nice here who um, who are saying very much the same thing. You know, but <laughs> we don't want to be put upon by the government, etc. So using exactly that language. So it's a kind of universal plea at the present day. But it's certainly true that it was much more forcibly 
contextualized perhaps in the United States. And the other aspect of it, of course, is the United States is a, is a federal state. And it's one of the things that the, 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 the way the federal state operates uh, has become very much more problematical during this pandemic, which is a whole new story. But I mean, in the, particularly in the absence of any clear leadership from the, from the federal government. And so the, 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 uh, the federal nation, nature of the relationships in the states has become far more acute. So you get a lot more of this you know, freedom and so on in these places where you would expect to find Idaho and so on, so on than you do in somewhere like California, for instance, where you have a much more, a much more civil society. Yeah, I think you kind of touched already a little bit on, on, on another topic I would like to go into because we have now been talking as, as of the Enlightenment as this, this dominant idea. And, and you also have touched upon that one of the, of, of the reasons why it can lay claim to universalism is because it, it rests on, or it, it at least attempted to rest, on reason and rationality as its core tenets. But even shortly after the Enlightenment as an idea emerged, it encountered resistance in the form of the so-called counter-Enlightenment or anti-Enlightenment, particularly in form of German idealism and, and Romanticism. How would you describe this relationship? And would it be fair to argue that the counter-enlightenment can be seen as a backlash against the idea that ultimately human life can be managed and understood in the same way as we understand and manipulate the laws of physics. Also, what you already touched upon, this, this strong emphasis on individuality and, and individualism. Yes, I think this, for the first thing to be said is that, as I tried to say in that, that, the, that book, the, um, the Enlightenment and why it still matters, is that uh, I think this is a, a misrepresentation of the Enlightenment. That, that is to say, which is not to say that the idea of rationality and, 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 and the laws of human conduct and so on are not an important part of it. I mean, the whole idea of creating a, what they called a science de l'homme, you know, a science of man, uh, and which would um, actually you know, apply laws to human behavior. But that human behavior to which those laws are being implied wasn't restricted to rationality as such. And if you think of, there's a whole um, part of the Enlightenment, um, which is sort of in a sense summed up in that famous phrase of David Hume, you know, the, um, reason is and ought to be a slave of the passions. So you have this idea that there is a, there is a, a component of the human being which is more than mere rationality. And the rationality can, in fact, in many cases, be mere rationality. It's a necessary part of human action, but it's only part of that. Now, I think a lot of the, the, the vision of the Enlightenment as being um, this cold, indifferent, uh, rationalistic, this we, we do owe to um, German idealism and romanticism, I think, rather than to the Enlightenment itself. I think it's a misrepresentative. And above all, we owe it to people like Held and Fichte, you know, who does talk of in these terms. And I should say, I mean, it could almost be, if you wanted to make a caricature of it, you could almost be reduced to the fact that um, it, we owe it to the fact that, um, like many um, people, Held was uh, extremely... Um, had an extremely troubled relationship with his old teacher. And so you get this rejection of Kant and it, it, the, the vision of, of, of uh, you know, the Enlightenment has been based upon this rationality is a Kantian one. Right? So if you took, you reduced Alf Clarum to Kant and you reduce Romanticism to Heller, then you get a conflict between master and pupil, which makes perfectly good sense in this continuum. And it then becomes something that this, but it, of course there is a sense also that there's a, a great deal of um, uh, the aspects of romanticism that um, is also a rejection of the, and, and this I think has to do a lot to do, and I try to, to discuss this in, in my new book, has a lot to do with what happens. In fact, they're, they're the, the sort of contingent reality plays a role. What happens during uh, the latter part of the, of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century up until <coughs> the, the Congress of Vienna. And that is to say this rejection of universalism and not universalism as it were embracing the whole world, but universalism within Europe. So you have this sort of Hedarian, and I take Hedar as an example because he's not obviously the only one, but all of the romantics from, from right the way across Europe, from Sweden to England to Ireland, fall into some of the same lines, that what we're celebrating now is the particular, 
all right the the individual the individual the charismatic individual the particular who read the literature at the time the, the novels of the time are all based upon this and the insistence therefore and this 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 goes with the rise of the idea of the nation and the nation state and the rise of the rise of nationalism this is trying, again the point i'm trying to make in the new book and um so it, it's it's a it, it's ironic in a sense because a lot of the a lot of the sort of nationalism that comes out of the 19th century is a way of attempting to negotiate between this universalism of um, the cosmopolitanism, universalism of the 18th century, which for many people seems to be a, a, a too remote ideal, you know, something that's not e easily accessible and um, and um, you know has has no 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 location, no fixed point to the kind of nationalism we associate with Nazi Germany and fascist Italy in, 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 the, in the 20th century. But um, the, 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 between that period, you have the rise of these nationalist sense, the sense of you know, liberal nationalism that's come to be called, in which you have a universalism, but it's a universalism of nations, right? So we have all of these particularities that come together and there are no common values or rather there are common values, but the most important common value is, is tolerance, right? So that the, you, you agree to accommodate, sort of, but you don't agree to share. You agree to accept, but you don't necessarily agree to share. So there's that aspect of, of what constitutes the new romanticism. But as I said, I think the important thing is the, 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 the emphasis on this particular and the local, the value of the particular and local, hence you know, the, 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 the re-evaluation of the Gothic, Gothic, the rise of national histories, uh, the creation of the modern um, academic system, in a sense, which is also geared to the projection of a national image. The rise of sociology, the rise of nationalism, uh, sorry, the rise of sociology, the rise of historic, historicism, all of these things have some, are in some way linked to the emergence of the idea of the of the new conception of the nation, which is very which owes a lot to the Enlightenment, but it also owes quite a lot to a reaction against the Enlightenment. If you allow me, I'd, I'd like to push this question a little a little more because in your new book you also talk quite extensively about the history of Russia, which I think is is sometimes seems a little bit the. Uh, Again, a, a very special case we're laying between Asia and Europe and, and where they belong. But in the 19th century, for example, if you look at, at Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment or, or Tolstoy's uh, Anna Karenina, but even in, 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 in France with, with Flaubert's Madame Bovary, so the, the kind of, I was, without, seeing, without I don't want to make a caricature out of, of the Enlightenment, but this modernity with, it, with its emphasis on that the world is graspable and, and subject to progress. And it, has, it seemed to have caused a certain unease. I think one, one author who put it probably most bluntly was Thomas Carlyle, right? When he talks about heroes and hero worship, yeah. and this, the yeah. fear that this is, this is gonna, gonna, gonna break away. So uh, I think, you're, I, think it's, I agree with you kind of to, 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 to say there were two clear camps. There were the pro-enlightenment guys and the counter-enlightenment guys. I think, I think it's, it's again a dialectic, like we talked before, between ideas and, and external circumstances. But this, this, when Habermas talks about this also a little bit, kind of this, 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 this loss of, 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 of the, this feeling, as Habermas says, this feeling that something is missing. And, and, and then this, despite the material progress, that came with the enlightenment, that the cultural change was one where all of a sudden, as you said also before, the mythical part fell away. The, the, yeah. the, the simple justification for you believe in something just because became much, much harder to maintain because there was the power of reason, the power of a universal argument to be met. And that seemed to be getting increasingly difficult. Yes, I think, I think don't forget again, I would, I would like to say that the, 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 um, the aftermath of the, French Revolution had a great deal to do with bringing about conditions of these changes, um, and therefore, and the rise of these uh, these particular nations, including, of course, Russia. Um, so that the um, uh, the it's not merely an intellectual or a cultural response to a previous generation, although it could be conceived in that way. I mean, as I was just couched it previously, if you conceived it in the council of master-pupil relation between Kant and Herder, um, it's a caricature, but in a way, you know, this, you throw off the master, um, uh, you kill your father, so to speak, in Freudian terms, and um, you create a new world. And what you're looking at is precisely the things that your father doesn't think of any real value. So you go back to the idea of the folk as a sort of, 
an, an, an entity which has its own its own presence, its own, own position in time, its own position in in, in space, and its own ge geography. Which of course, important geography is another another science which emerges in the nineteenth century as specifically linked to this conception of um, how we manipulate our relationship with space and time, so that you have this idea of the nation becoming a, a clearly defined space. I mean, not in Heather's argument, you know, it's sort of it's set in stone, it's created by nature, we don't have to go that far, but certainly the idea that there exists, this idea of the, uh, of the nation. Now, you could say that there was a, I think there is a sense and, and of the, the falling away, if you like, uh, in the Enlightenment of a losing something uh, there in a lot of the people that follow on from this that you have a falling away in the sense that you, that, that maybe that religion is one of the things that falls away um, uh, the, the sense of potential possibility in a system of belief not just one that will secure you some understanding of the afterlife, uh, but also will give you some kind of security, because after all, what the Enlightenment was offering you was, for all that it isn't based entirely upon reason, and insist upon this, that there's a whole strong psychological dimension to it. It is that you're on your own. Right? There is no one out there to help you. And you can't seek assistance. Um, this is, I mean, this is strongly present in Kant, but it's not just in Kant. You can't seek assistance uh, as, as Kant puts it in, you know, Vastas uh, Klan, quite clearly, you can't seek assistance from your pastor, you can't seek assistance from your ruler. These things, you've got to be, you know, you've got to sapere uh, you've got to know, you've got to dare to know by yourself. So that, con that central message, which is very alarming, I think for, certainly for most people, um, was a, it re required some kind of feat, you know, kind of reaction and that reaction was a form of what has come to be called communitarianism you know and you can see something unfortunately evolving i mean it depends where you take a negative positive view but evolving today in the, particularly in the united states increasingly insistent upon identity being or or human human presence really being bound up with the notion of community right the 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 the, the, the romantic nation uh, romantic notions are of the nation uh, uh, romantic na nationhood is very ana is analogous to what we see today uh, in the community, and the community is always seen as microcosms, not something that exists within the nation rather than absorbing the nation itself. But th that's from what you draw your uh, essential um, identity it comes from that. Your presence comes from that. It doesn't come from your status qua human being, and that I think is on your st your capacity to to control your own life, your capacity to understand nature and the world around you in your own terms. That was the enlightenment. That's where your, where your identity as a person comes from. Now that's, you know, we, 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 the ideas, that's sort of the, the communitarian ideas, you, you re reject that and you reject it in favor of the notion that th this comes to you from the community. And the Do you think that one of the, of the reasons for, for for this 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 dilemma between between individualism and and communitarianism, or the on the one hand, the desire to be who we are individually, but at the same time the desire to be part of a community. That this is that the the originally the individual. Well, with Christianity it's a little bit trickier. But that that when on the one hand the Enlightenment broke the individual out of the of of kind of being just a. a, a you know, kind of a cog in a larger machine, allowing the individual to be him or herself. But of course, at the same time, the what 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 it gained in in individualism, it lost in communitarianism, and that all societies, to some extent, kind of that this is an oscillating problem to which we haven't really for now. I think many ideologies, without simplifying, but I think that many ideologies very often try to bridge exactly that problem. Right? How can you preserve individuality? But of course, also preserve or kind of deal with the desire we have to be part of a community. And I think we see this strongly. I mean, I guess one of the most underestimated developments in recent years has been the social media revolution. And one of the key features of social media is the individual desire, right, to be seen by others or what, what, what Fukuyama in his interpretation of Hegel then calls the desire for recognition. And that is an obstacle to true individualism. And this, these two poles, I think, remain one of the, the, the key problems for, for, and I think they're also part of the story of the Enlightenment and the Counter-Enlightenment. Again, I'm simplifying here, and, and this seems so difficult to bridge. Yeah, no, no, I think, I think, I mean, I think that is the, that is the struggle. I mean, um, uh, you know, you can't, um, 
<laughs> you can't, you don't want to be in it, but you can't get out of it. I mean, in a way, it goes back. It, I mean, you think about it nicely summed up by uh, Kant's views on social sociability. That's that's a perfect ignition. We know we are unsocial social. We, we feel more of up to ourselves if we're left on our own. On the other hand, we cannot exist by ourselves. So we are, we are unsocial social, sociable animals and we can't avoid sociability. But, um, and that leads to, a, in, in most extreme cases, to being you know shut into particular communities from which you can't emerge. Um, and or, or you know, in, in the nationalist form, of course, it leads to forms of extreme nationalism, which you want to shut your frontiers against people, and so on and so forth. On the other hand, you know, you can't, um, you cannot live on desert island. So there is this, there is this tension all the time, and I think I mean, can't capture that perfectly. And it's a, it's, it's a tension that runs through the whole of. Uh, of, of, of human history. It is, as you say, and there's, a, there's a, the need for, I mean, which is after another form of it. I mean, Hegel's idea of the need for recognition is, is the same thing as, I mean, it goes back to Rousseau's talk about, you know, the first society is created by the first people who dance around the tree and somebody said, you know, you dance better than he does or you're more beautiful than she is, um, were the first people to establish society because precisely what they established was a recognition of difference and excellence among individuals. And that is where the community begins, in a sense. And we 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 can't avoid this uh, um, with conflict. And you could say that what you get in this shift from enlightenment to the to romanticism, I should say by way of Prince, I rather resist the idea of a counter enlightenment. But I think you go from um, enlightenment to romanticism, then you do get a shift from, as it were, one pole to the other. That's to say, to the to the. Um, I mean, it's, it's a probably a crude way of representing it, but you know, we can't avoid that, of the insistence upon the paramount importance of the individual, the individual um, individual you know, capacities for self-understanding, and uh, not uh, as well as reason to, on the other hand, a belief that you know, we, are, we are merely part of a, of a larger whole, and, and being part of that larger whole, so being a patriot, let's say, or being a, a nationalist, is what really counts. It's being part of the whole that matters. When I'm not part of the whole, I am nothing. I'm only, I am nothing if I'm outside the, the community to which I belong. To, do, to return a little bit to the topic of your, uh, of your most recent book, I think one of the things you work out quite nicely is that many of the ideas that strike us as very modern, cosmopolitanism, ideas like constitutional patriotism, they actually have been around 200 years ago. So, so many of the things that probably would say, well, this is a very modern uh, way to, to, to look at the world, they actually have been debated among uh, many of the Enlightenment philosophers already 200 years ago. So do, do you think in light of this, that these ideas have been around, is it fair again to use, to use a term by Habermas, that the Enlightenment is an unfinished project and kind of added to this, that Europe remains an unfinished project and, and probably to some extent will remain as such for the, for the foreseeable future. I think, um, I think the first thing to say is that what would a finished project look like? I mean, that's, that's the question. I mean, so particularly an enlightenment, you know, enlightenment is, uh, it's interesting, the different languages that are used in this, because, you know, in German, as you know, it, it has this sense of a process of being, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, Whereas the Enlightenment suggests a historical period, which is fine because people like Condorcet and, 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 and Diesel and so on did think of it like that. They did think there was a period which they were going to, the siècle des Lumières, you know, it was a, a century of Enlightenment. I mean, so there was a historical period which was going to lead to something, some kind of process of outcome. They weren't quite sure what it was. They, they, they didn't, you know, but there was going to be a, a, a better world ahead. And that was going to be the result of this siècle de lumière. It was going to change people's mindset completely. So I think, um, yeah, I mean, there's this, there's, there is this sense in which it, it's uh, it's an unfinished project because it is, um, you know, a constant search for uh, better um, a better understanding of how to, you know, make it make life better for ourselves and better for those around us if we want a better world. I think as far as uh, and. As far as the um, as far as the, the view of, of, of Europe is concerned, that is certainly the case. But then I, you know, it is an unfinished project, um, and you know, there's this this the, the, the EU's phrase "ever closer union" has been taken to mean precisely that ever closer. You know, you never you're never going to get close. You're going to get ever closer. Uh, so uh, what is what is the, and I say that in the book a bit. You know, what is the final outcome? We don't have a model for a final outcome, and if we did. 
we would be, in a sense, uh, denying one of those basic tenets that really go back to, you know, to the 17th century, if not earlier, which is that human, and it's a very simple one, you know, that human beings are, uh, exist in a state of potential, uh, sorry, of, of, of perennial change. And, you know, we are constantly evolving uh, beings. And as, you know, as Hobbes said, you know, there's no summum bonum. Um, you know, there's only, there's no ultimate good. There is only the, the pursuit of the desire uh, for, for, you know, change what he says. Or he could say things in terms of there's only the pursuit of power, but it could be the pursuit of good. It could be the pursuit of something. But it's always this idea that there's a continual change and the objectives then change as you move forward. So there's no, um, there's no sort of, there's, there's no Marxist state in which we're all going to go, you know, everyone's going to give up and everyone's going to go fishing and be happy. That's not, that doesn't, I mean, that the Marxist view is completely wrong in that respect, great respect for Marx. But I think that that idea of history, that Hegelian Marxist idea of history, in which or, or the Fukuyama sort of version of it, in which there's some kind of end, which we've come to. Now we can, right now we can sit back and say, you know, and there have been stories, there have been suggestions by classicists, you know, I mentioned this with, for instance, with Rome, that one of the reasons why Rome stagnates and then if collapses is partly because people began to believe at some point in the fifth, fourth, and fifth centuries that they had actually reached that point, all right? And there was, there was nothing to do now. You just, the, the machine would run itself. And, and uh, it, we, we now lived in the perfect world, as far as the elite is concerned, anyway. And um, we didn't have to do anything. And that was the beginning of the end. So I think there's, we have to, I mean, it's a very banal remark, but I mean, we have to consider that we're in a constant movement forward. So to think of the Euro EU in particular, which is a, an, in, an institutional legal structure as, as a sort of culmination of what Europe is, uh, or that there being any sort of possible culmination at the end is a mistake. We are in a constant state of, of, of change and, and I hope amelioration and the constant change of meeting new new time in the, the present pandemic is one thing that one couldn't, uh, you could have anticipated, but um, people did anticipate it, but not to the extent that you did, as another threat to what it means to be unified and so on. There's a constant sources of change and modification. If we'd stepped back a hundred years and said, uh, you know, where would we, uh, where, no, take further back than that, where would we stand in 1919? You would never have been able to predict, for instance, where what, what the next 50 years is going to produce. And the kind of world that the, the League of Nations tried to imagine, which is not so hugely different from what certain people tried to imagine in 48 and 40, 40, 45 to 48, for instance, um, came to a completely different set of fruition. So I think that there is, a, there is this ongoing notion that we have to be constantly prepared to change. One point uh, that from the parts I've read of your book that, that really struck me as important, and I'd like you to talk a little bit about this, you quote Klaus Offe, uh, and you write about the capacity for self-reflection and self-criticism is something unique to European civilization, and that from the Crusades to colonial rule to the Holocaust, there is indeed plenty on which to self-reflect critically upon. But, but do, and this, is, this is, of course, now a very tricky question, and I'll, I'll try to tread as lightly as I can, but do you think that at some point critical self-reflection could turn itself into an identity crisis. Uh, for example, the late Roger Scruton, he talks about what he calls oikophobia, right? What he defines as the, the repudiation of inheritance and home. And the French philosopher Pascal Bruckner has written an entire book he titled The Tyranny of Guilt, that he says has afflicted Europe and, and, and is, is a hindrance, so to speak, for, for its further development because it's, it's a constant looking back and, and kind of, you know, feeling to, that there is a carrying of a historical burden that, that precludes it, so to speak, from, from really contributing, let's say, to, 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 certain, to certain issues. Do you think there's any truth to these arguments? Or yes, I think there's a great deal of truth to them, but I'm not sure that the, I mean, there's the, <clears throat> the trouble about the, um, the forms of self-criticism, and I think this is, I, I, Klaus Hoff is one of the few people to actually sort of come out and say it outright, is, I mean, it, it's, it's very unusual. All right. I mean, you could say there are lots of things that are unique about Europe. Most of the things that Europeans have extolled, the uniqueness of being, you know, the sciences, the arts, and so on and so forth. Self-criticism of this kind, I mean, taken to the extremes that um, they are being taken in, in parts of Europe and the United States to this day, are very rare, if not unique. I don't want to say anything because I don't have enough knowledge, but I very much doubt you'd find that sort of level. You certainly don't find it in the other great cultures. You didn't find it in the Ottoman Empire. You don't find it in the Chinese, I don't think, today in the slightest. Um, it's, not a, it's not a property that um, is, is universal by any means. 
it's 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 desirable, obviously, um, at one level, but it, it can have the results you're talking about. It can lead to a certain kind of paralysis, um, and I think there is a danger of that. I think there is a danger of paralysis. There's a danger in the academic world, apart from anything else. I mean, that's because it's a small part of it, and it really isn't is very minor. But as you probably, I'm mean, sure you've had the same experience. This is there is sort of only one line you can take about certain things, and one view you can have about certain things, and that has got to be a critical one. It's got to be a constant uh, condemnation of uh, past agents um, of, of, of the history of Europe, for instance, as being nothing other than sort of you know kind of pre. pre prelude to, 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 to colonialism and the Holocaust and so on. And this is, the, the, the effect of this is extremely stultifying as a part of trying to understand what the process is leading up to both of these two phenomena where they were. And, um, you know, there's a great deal of, there's a tendency among historians, particularly historians dealing with very sensitive subjects like the ones I mentioned in that. Uh, or, or Klaus Offen mentions there, of, of uh, treating these as not areas that we should try and understand, uh, but it's merely that we should judge, and they should be judged merely from the standpoint of the 21st century, which I always think is a bit like, you know, accusing St. Augustine of believing, being a fool for believing in God, you know, I mean, it's, uh, it's not that we are the products of the age we live in, and, um, you know, the people now making criticisms of our past ancestors are likely to find themselves in the same position in a hundred years time, or they would if they were alive then. So, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a kind of stultifying, uh, curiously enough, the effect of it, like all forms of phobia, and I think Scruton, it's a, it's a nice, nice coinage that, like a lot of his coinages, um, captures something in that what it has is the effect of actually to deaden criticism, right? Because all it turns into is a form of phobia, which is a form of rejection. And so we can't perceive what we not we can't perceive what the values might be of of these past forms of behavior of agency of, of of political forms. We also can't perceive what um, what the dangers of them might really be because we're so focused on you know just merely damning them that we can't see them when they come around a second time. So it's altogether a, an unfortunate. Uh, an unfortunate position. And I think also there's, 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 there's been a back, and there's the possibility, of course, of a backlash. There are, there are as you say, Bruckner is one of them, though it's not the only one who's, who's come up with this, with this notion that, you know, we're, we're undermining our own capacities by, by refusing to acknowledge, by trying to, by refusing to sort out what is beneficial and what is not beneficial from our own past. I didn't perhaps make enough of that in, in this book. I think, um, uh, uh, that particular point that you focused on, um, I perhaps should have extended that more. But I, but I think there is that danger. Yes. Before we move on, just as a, as a maybe as a passing remark, because I don't want to get too much into into kind of contemporary politics and contemporary issues, but. As, as you treat it in this part of your book, quoting Klaus Oppert, which naturally is also topic of your book, you focus mostly on Europe and how this, these things have developed in Europe, but you kind of already touched a little bit upon it. This seems to have swept over at least gradually or in certain circles into the United States as well, right? I think okay. without, and again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even going to making a, a judgment about the intentions or, or, or the moral ideas behind it. They, they, they are what they are. But this, for example, the idea of whether it's toppling statues or, or as the, the New York Times had the 1619 project, right? Where the argument was made that the true founding of the United States was in 1619 when the first uh, African slave arrived um, in the, in the, in the British colonies. So this, 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 some, some extreme critics, more, again, with a, probably a significant political bias would argue that Howard since people's history of the United States falls into this, this category where kind of the, the history also of the United States is very much told in a, in a negative light. And even that this goes a little bit to what I kind of saved as my, my, we're not there yet as my final question is <laughs> these things, the, the point is not so much whether they are factually True, because because they, they might well be, but of course, it's the focus on it that, that can have significant social consequences, right? It's, it's like if, if you are married to someone and you, like your spouse or your the, the, the other person will never be perfect, but if you focus only on the negative, right, the marriage might at some point get problematic. That doesn't mean that these things are not there, but it, it's the focus. And I think this is in Europe as well as in, in the United States, there is justifiably, right, especially for historians and political scientists, like they, they cannot opt this out. But if the main narrative of a society becomes 
as someone negative one, this kind of helps me to move back to Europe is, for example, why should any migrant coming to Europe want to integrate into a society that tells a story about, I'm, I'm exaggerating here for dramatic effect, that tells us how terrible we are? Because then I might would say, you know what? I'm glad to be here. I'm glad for the economic opportunities, but culturally, ideologically, I'm going to keep to myself because all what I hear from you guys is how horrible you are. So, so again, even though things might be factually true, it can have the way we look at them can have actual social consequences. That's true. Um, I think um, I think there's a there's a there's. I mean, this is it takes an extremely exaggerated form, and I think it's also the other. I mean, as, as far as your larger political point is concerned, also rather restricted. Um, I think that the number of people who think in these very extreme ways, rather than just being sort of, you know, capable of self-criticism, saying we made mistakes here, we've got to improve them here, we don't want to, you know, we, we don't want to repeat history, we don't want history to catch us unawares and so on and so forth. Um, and um, it, the number of people who believe that we've got to rewrite the history of the United States, of all places, which of course sees itself as having a radical break from Britain. You, know, you can say you can write the history of the British colonists from that point on. That's fine. I mean, that doesn't. In fact, that's to be totally untrue. I mean, you could you could choose another another moment from the founding of the British colonies, which would be just as reprehensible um, in the destruction of the indigenous populations, for instance. So, I mean, the, the, but that's one thing. But the whole point about the, the the and I know what I know what the argument is because the the. Because, and the French had seen this at the time, don't forget, because the United States did not abolish slavery in, in, uh, in, in, in after, after the revolution, um, it was a failed project. And that's presumably the basic argument. And it's the, the, the Condorcet's argument as well. And he says, of course, they're going to do it any minute now. Uh, he's writing in 1797. And he's saying any moment now they're going to change. Of course, of course they are. But I mean, until they do, it's a failed project. Certainly not that the Americans are aware of what the French are saying. The contemporary Americans are aware of what the French are saying. But I mean, you can see that in a sense, you can say, yes, it was a failed project until the thick what created the United States was a civil war. That's, that's a relatively common uh, place narrative. And so, you know, putting it in that light, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't look so uh, reprehensible, absurd, but I mean, the um, the problem, but the, the second problem you mentioned about integration and so on, I think it's, uh, uh, I don't think that's a real problem. I think what people, the, the real problem isn't so much we are so terrible, it's the backlash against we are so terrible. Right? Um, because the populist movements that, that, that what, what, the, the, what the real opposition to immigration or to the possibility of creating a sort of more integrated society has come from the populist right that doesn't see itself as being so critical at all. So I think that um, you know we're talking about a really quite small movement within, of course it could expand, but within elite circles, particularly academic ones. Um, and I think the danger of the danger of this, this the danger of the overstatement of the, the oikophobia element. Uh, is precisely that it it, 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 it it creates a space for populism. Um, it, it, it exaggerates the position of, of the, it gives the populace much more scope for, for maneuver. So we need a much more balanced way of looking at our own past, which is both critical, as it should be with all peoples, but not, uh, not openly, simply, uh, simply condemnatory in that respect. So that the, 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 you know, the, the, I, the, the refugee or whoever it is comes here says, yes, I, you know, I have a, a good reason for wishing to be here because it provides me with these things. And it provides me with these things. It's capable of providing me with it because it is a particular kind of society. And, uh, you know, it's not just that it's offering me a job which I couldn't get in, in back home. It's offering me a job which I couldn't get back home and social welfare and housing and medicine and so on. And it's offering me all these things and protection from violence from others and so on because it's the kind of society it is and I want to belong. Therefore, because it's that kind of society I wish to belong to it. And not necessarily because, you know, the, this is another thing, and not necessarily because it's a, it's a Europe that has, you know, it has, of course, evolved in this way from classical Greece, for instance. You know. 
Do you think, as a, as a final question, if if we look at Europe today, and, and I think a lot of of it is, you know, or many of the, the the most important issues have been well captured by our conversation. Do you think that the the gap between the the new member states, the particular the Eastern European member states and the Western European member states, do you think that this is a, that, that this is real? I think this this is an ongoing debate. You know that that that, that Hungary, Poland, um, to some extent the Czech Republic that they really do have a different view on what they think a unified Europe or an ever closer union should look like. And again, very heavily influenced by, by the view on migration, by the view on, on, on patriotism and nationalism and the, the way that, that Western Europe looks at it. You mentioned something, you use, I think, a very nice term in your book, kind of that maybe Western Europe is, is you know, more postmodern compared to, to, to Eastern Europe, which, which might be more, what the thinking there might be still more, uh, this is difficult to say because I, I, I don't mean it negative in any sense, but that they think more in classic nationalist terms, whereas Western Europe has attempted to kind of overcome it in a postmodern fashion without the meta narrative of, of the nation, where this is still very prevalent in Eastern Europe. Yes, I think that's probably right. I think it's certainly true that you know that Hungary as it currently is and Poland as it currently is, and uh, you know uh, th these are um, even you know places like um, Romania and so on are are states that have, as it were, gone through a process of of uh, of change. Um, they've skipped a generation. I mean, they've gone from being you know pre-nationalist to being, to being nationalist, um, whereas Europe's gone from being nationalist to being post-nationalist. So I think that there's a, there's a, and that this is, this is, has of course been brought about by, by, by the crisis. I mean, I think that the, 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 the concept that you would want to be, um, you would want to free yourself from the Soviet Union and what it meant from being under the, under the shadow of the Soviet Union by joining this modernistic project, which was Union, which was Europe, which was what, what we had in the, in the, in the 19, uh, you know, in, in, up into the beginning of the, the 21st century. That uh, has obviously receded and it's been replaced by, as I said, either this idea that, you know, you want to sort of Putin-esque uh, you, you want to get away from all of this, you want to go back to where you were before, or the more sinister version, which is Orban's version, is that the whole of Europe should become an image of Hungary. So, you know, eventually we should, and you know, this is the sort of, this is shared by the Le Pens and the, and the, the other the nationalist leaders in uh, Salvis and so on, the, the, the populist leaders across Europe would agree with uh, they're more inclined to try and break up the union altogether. They're more inclined to go back to old forms of nationalism that doesn't. I mean, Orban's vision is quite interesting, and in he he still sees it as a, as a as a sort of potential coalition of states, but a coalition of states that is sort of armored against um, modernity in 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 the sense of you know modernity in, in the sense of you know having a having a free liberal society which is uh, tolerant and and, and and which Christianity doesn't play a necessarily central role and so on. On the one hand, and on the other, um, being an, an, a body of, of, of cooperating states to, and that, that would face itself off against Russia and 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 Britain, so, sorry, and, and and the United States. So we're going back to the vision of of the nineteen of the nineteen forties. I think that the this has been brought out brought on by the crisis. So we we don't know what consequences whether this is a, a teething process. I mean, it's entire, I think there's a lot of views. Certainly, the view in, in many regions of Brussels is that it is a teeth process, and that you know we, there's very little you can actually do about it because the union as itself doesn't have all that many much uh, capacity for sanction, and if it and it doesn't use what it what it has, uh, very reluctant to use what it has. Um, that rather than antagonize the people by trying to push them into line, rather than acting like Moscow, which is of course what the accusation against Brussels always is. So um, be the sort of liberal society you are, D discuss with these people that eventually uh, they will use the ballot box to come around to, uh, we haven't chosen to do so yet, but they will use the ballot box to come around, to, particularly um, when the, um, uh, you know, when the crisis of um, migration passes, as it almost certainly will. But I think there is a uh, there is a difference. Now, the one interesting, the one or two rather states which might have been in a similar position and went in a completely different direction was Spain and Portugal. I mean, they both came out of dictatorial regimes. Now, true, they were local ones. They were national 
dictatorial regimes, not regimes imposed from a, from a foreign power. So that makes obviously a huge difference. But they also saw uh, the coming into Europe as a way of escaping from this unfortunate past. And um, that it, and it, it, as it's turned out, it's been enormously successful. I mean, let's not say that they aren't without their political difficulties, but they're both very good Europeans and they both behave as very good Europeans. And there's very little, very little, opposition to Europe within Spain, you know, despite the Catalan crisis and so on. So I think there's a, there is, there is a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a possibility that Eastern Europe, um, the more politically significant states or economically significant states, which obviously Poland and Hungary, of Eastern Europe will eventually emerge. But again, it's the question of ever closer union. You know, we have a, a future project, not a present one. So this brings me to my final question. When will your book be available? Oh, um, well, I don't know yet. <laughs> By this time next summer, uh, certainly, but um, I'm hoping they'll get it out before then, but I don't know. You know it's the Oxford University Press book. It's their trade division, which is usually more zappy than the academic division, but it's, uh, it's still a slow process, even today, even with modern technology. You can get out books in months, uh, but academic presses tend to be rather more slow about the process. All right, and I'll make sure to keep our viewers and listeners posted uh, once, it, once it comes out. Well, thank you so much for your time. Uh, this was great. 